It is recording. Wonderful. Good morning, guests. We will get started in about one minute. But as you've already found, you can use the chat to communicate with us. We will be moderating the chat and taking any questions by a Q&A or chat, and we will supply them to our presenters at the end of the presentation for a Q&A. And I would like to start the program today with a land acknowledgement. Uh, you're joining the Hidden History's New Light on Portland's Old and New Chinatowns, 1851 through 1950 today. And we do acknowledge and honor the indigenous peoples and their descendants of the Lower Columbia and Willamette River region, whose lands the city of Portland and our museum currently occupy. These include Willamette, Tumwater, Clackamas, Kathlamet, Malala, Multnomah, and Watlala Chinook tribes, and the Tualatin Kalapuya, who are today part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and the many other Chinookan peoples who established communities along the Lower Columbia, whose descendants are today members of the Grand Ronde, Warm Springs, and Silet's Confederated Tribes of Oregon. Today, about the Hidden, Hidden, Hidden History series, this uh, program is a part of Oregon's Early Chinatowns and Chinese Worker Settlements series, organized and moderated by the Portland Chinatown Museum. This is in partnership with statewide organizations. Hidden Histories aims to provide a better understanding of Chinese immigrant history and culture, and its importance to Oregon's growing Asian American population by sharing stories of Oregon's early rural and urban Chinese settlements. We would like to acknowledge that Hidden Histories was made possible in part by a grant from the Oregon Humanities, a statewide nonprofit organization and an independent affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities, which funds Oregon Humanities grants programs. For 50 years, Oregon Humanities has offered programs and publications that help Oregonians connect, reflect, and learn from one another. And Kapiolani will be up next to tell you more about today's program. Um, hi, everyone. Today we are joined by historian Dr. Jack Jacqueline Peterson Loomis, who will provide an interpretive walkthrough of Portland Chinatown Museum's permanent exhibition called Beyond the Gate, A Tale of Portland's Historic Chinatown. And we're also joined by two beloved community elders, Bertha Shaggett and Norman Locke, who will share personal recollections of new Chinatown from 1920 to 1950. And with time permitting, a short Q&A will conclude our program today. Um, before I hand it over to Jackie, who will start their presentation, just want to read some bios for our special guest today. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Peterson Loomis is a professor emeritus of history at Washington State University. She began her academic career in Chicago in the late 1960s, receiving her MA and PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago while working at the Center for the History of the American Indian at the Newberry Library. A student of Indigenous and Comparative Ethnic Studies in North America between 1981 and 2010, she was faculty at the University of Minnesota and Washington State University. She has published widely, developed and curated three permanent exhibitions and produced public history and art installations, video and sound programs, some of which are permanent fixtures in Portland's Old Town. She moved to Portland in 1993 the first historian at the new Washington State University Vancouver campus and began volunteering in Old Town Chinatown. She co-founded the Old Town History Project in 2000, a catalyst and umbrella for multicultural history and museum organizations in Old Town. In 2014, she co-founded the Portland Chinatown History Foundation and its offspring, the Portland Chinatown Museum, which opened in 2018 with the installation of Beyond the Gate. She has served as the organization's volunteer executive director from 2014 to her retirement in April 2021. Bertha Saget is the daughter of paper son immigrants who landed in Portland, Oregon in 1923 when the United States outlawed Chinese immigration to our nation. Born in 1925, she attended elementary and high school in Portland. English was her second language. There were no English as a second language courses or social services at that time. She was a shy, timid, and 
timid and awkward among her classmates, but did well in school and graduated from Oregon State College in 1948 with a bachelor degree in secondary education. As no school in Oregon would hire a Chinese teacher, she got a high school teaching position um, in Clackamas, Washington. And according to a newspaper report at the time, she became the first Chinese American high school teacher in the Northwest. After four years of teaching, she got married, had five children, and returned to teaching in 1971 with Portland schools. Norman Locke is a fourth generation Chinese American and native Oregonian. He has been a central figure in Oregon and Chinese American civic affairs for much of his life. He helped revive the Portland Lodge of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance in the 1960s, um, was a regional grand representative on the national CACA and served on the board of the Northwest China Council. With a background in the arts and degrees to finance, in finance and economics, Norman has served as an Oregon Arts Commissioner, Portland Art Museum Trustee, Chair of the Portland Building Corps, Portland City Hall 100 Year Renovation Advisor, and the Oregon 150 Celebration Board. Norman helped fund the Kamwa Chung Museum in John Day, Garden of Surging Waves in Astoria, Portland Chinese Classical Garden, which is now known as the Longe Garden, and Portland Chinatown Museum in Portland. Um, a former administrative law judge, he is also the founding principal of Columbia Coin Company. Um, he is passionate about preserving Chinese American history and culture for future generations. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Jackie, um, who's gonna explain a little bit more about hidden histories. Hello everyone. Uh, this is really a, a, a really important time, I think in, in Asian American history, as we all know. And I'm very proud uh, to have served these many years, uh, the Portland Chinatown Museum after 10 years before that, working on the Old Town History Project. Uh, when I arrived here uh, in, the, in the early 90s, even though my, field, my teaching field had been Native American history, um, and I had just completed a, a major traveling exhibition, I moved to Portland rather than Vancouver. And, and, and I made Portland my, my adopted home, and, and, and that was the right, the right decision for me. But I was immediately, for some reason, drawn to Old Town Chinatown. Uh, and at that time, uh, this is now the, the mid 90s, even though this was not a place I think where in that time, of course, I knew absolutely nothing uh, about Portland's Chinese, but it was clear that it wasn't a place where very many Chinese Americans actually made their residence. I mean, it was not a place that they could any longer call home. Nonetheless, uh, the old families were still here. They were still running restaurants that served dim sum. There were Chinese groceries, pharmacies, laundries, and other for-profit businesses. And on weekends, people in large numbers still came down for holidays and to fraternize social clubs run by local Chinese family associations and tongs and the cultural centers such as the CCBA with its vibrant Saturday Chinese language school on Northwest Davis. As, 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 as Hippiolani mentioned, my teaching and research focus uh, at the universities have always been Native American studies and comparative American cultures, but I was struck by the similarity of the stories of racism and discrimination that I heard particularly from Asian Americans, but also from Greek and Jewish and African American people in the neighborhood in what was reputedly, I was shocked to learn, the whitest city in America. Uh, in 2000, I did help to found the Old Town History Project, which was an umbrella group for mutual support among leaders of fledgling ethnic museums and cultural centers and art initiatives in Old Town. For the next 13 years, we recorded oral histories, created elders walking tours, exhibits and public programs in a storefront on Northwest David, Davis provided by Central City Concern, and later in a space within the New Market Theater building provided by John Beardsley. Our mission was to preserve and interpret the stories, artifacts, and important cultural sites of Old Town in the past century and a half, and to educate and challenge public stereotypes. The work begun there rapidly advanced by the growth of Jewish, Nikkei, Greek, and now African American museums, and after 2014 by the new Portland Chinatown History Foundation and its museum in 2018, 
He's exposed a long unacknowledged history of racial prejudice, discrimination, deadly violence, and exclusion, which has masked the many contributions of early Chinese to the urban and rural development of Oregon and to its cultural diversity. For all that, there is still much to be done. Back in, 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 in the mid-1990s, uh, I was shocked to learn that there was nothing in the state's educational standards about Oregon Chinese or Chinese exclusion. And unfortunately, that is still true today. Although there are now units on Japanese internment, the Holocaust, Oregon tribes, and on Oregon's peoples of color. Arguably, however, the story of the Chinese the first full-scale immigration of a non-European population to Oregon is long overdue. One of the ironies of the hidden history of the Chinese in Oregon is that the first wave of Chinese immigrants to the West Coast, a response to the 1848 gold strike at Sutter's Mill in Northern California, would lead to the codification of America's first federal immigration policy and law, one of exclusion, based on nationality and race. The Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 would become by the 1920s, the roadmap for the similarly racist exclusion of other groups in Southeast Asia, as well as Southern European Jews, Orthodox Greeks and Catholics, immigrants and asylum seekers from Central and South America and Muslims from Africa and the Middle East. During America's colonial and early national periods, it had been assumed that all white Protestant English speaking British Isles and Western European immigrants would take up land or a trade and become citizens. Although most would not meet the property requirements to vote in those early years. This remained true despite second thoughts about the inclusion of new Catholic Irish and German immigrants until the 1850s when the accepted means of maintaining social order over those considered not fully human, such as subjecting African-Americans to the chains and violence of slavery and exterminating or removing uh, Native Americans who would not sign treaties of land cession, began to break down as growing numbers of Northern whites divided into abolitionist and pro-slavery camps, leading to mob violence and deadly attacks. The results were civil war and the failed experiment in racial equality, which was to follow the war called Reconstruction. Importantly, the first Chinese arrived on the West Coast during this hotly contested transitional period in American history. It, it may come as a surprise that by the 1840s and 50s, China's densely populated cities, imperial civilization, culture and manufacturers such as porcelain, silks, ebony, spices and teas had been well known in Europe since the publication of Marco Polo's travels and its products long coveted and sought after by British traders and American colonists alike, despite severe restrictions and monopoly prices charged by uh, Guangzhou's merchant traders. In retaliation, in the early 1800s, the English East India Company used its new plantations in India to grow and harvest opium with which to illegally flood Southeast China. The rapid spread of the highly addictive drug enabled late England with the help from merchant traders from the new American nation to wrest control of Hong Kong and the international trade in Chinese goods from imperial hands. Opium, thus unleashed in the 1840s, would wreak social and political havoc in China on a scale which exceeded what the opioid epidemic is doing in the US today. By the 1880s, it would also, however, come back to bite the Americans on their own shores. Poor British Isles immigrant workers seeking construction jobs on the West Coast after 1848 knew nothing of this backstory. They saw the Chinese only as their immediate economic rivals. Chinese immigrants' language, religious observances, hairstyles, and dress set them apart, but their strong work ethic, trade skills, sobriety, and cleanliness lauded by the railroad magnets was both a threat and an insult to British Isles' standards of manliness. It was a volatile mixture. It was not a coincidence that the 1880s and 90s 
saw simultaneously one in the South, the return of slavery in the form of sharecropping for landless African Americans and a repressive system of Jim Crow laws. On the Plains, the final defeat of the Western Indian tribes in their wars for independence and control of their ancestral lands. And three, on both coasts, the decision to make the Chinese exclusion law permanent for all new immigrants, meaning no further means of legal entry, asylum, or making a home in white Christian America after 1904. But it was equally ironic that by then, the Chinese were much too big a story to hide. As early as 1851, the Chinese were beginning to arrive from California and indirectly from China in numbers as first settlers, tradesmen, and merchant entrepreneurs in Oregon to establish businesses, homes, and families. By the 1880s, despite Portland leaders' intent to force the Chinese into a ghetto along Southwest 2nd Avenue, a block behind the dirty industries and warehouses crowding the Willamette, Portland's Chinese community quickly grew into the second largest Chinatown in America, second only to San Francisco in 1900. At an estimated nine to 10,000 persons during the off work season, the Chinese ranked as the largest ethnic group in greater Portland and more than 10% of its total population in 1900. If the presence and influence of these large numbers of Chinese immigrants in 19th century Portland and Oregon has been minimized and neglected, what other inaccuracies or stereotypes might we discover and challenge? One of the truly important unknown histories concerning concern the Chinese immigrants themselves. Who were they? Where did they come from? How did they get here? And who paid for their passage? Far from the assumed portrait of Eastern capitalists and their American representatives in San Francisco sending ships to Hong Kong to pick up waiting illiterate Chinese workers from a war-torn, disease-ridden, and destitute Southeast China to work in the gold mines and later railroads, it instead seems to have been educated junior members of land-wealthy Chinese farming families who first paid their own passage and established a foothold as tradesmen, miners, or construction workers, and who later brought their brothers, wives, and families and the ones established helped to fund and construct three-story buildings as we see here and in the photographs both before and after to house themselves along Second Avenue, as well as to bring large numbers of seasonal workers whom they, as the labor contractors, brought to America. In other words, it was Chinese merchants, not Americans, who recruited, transported, provisioned, oversaw and paid Chinese workers on distant construction railroad and fish processing and cannery jobs. It is not an exaggeration to say that old Chinatown by the 1880s was an extremely successful merchant community. Its elite members establishing local and distant connections with city and state business and political leaders and federal and local enforcement offices. Here we see uh, the interior of the Bo Yuan store, uh, which was in both old and new Chinatown. Uh, in 1900, there were more than 100 businesses in Chinatown, a half dozen Protestant Chinese missions and with night schools to be teaching English and numerous Chinese doctors and other professionals. This slide of the Bo Yuan dry goods store shows the original merchandise, which, <laughs> Amazingly, was put into storage when the store closed following the market crash of 1929 and was just revived by the grandson uh, of, its, of its, one of its owners a couple of years ago. And they were it was loaned to us. This is only a quarter of the actual contents of that, of that store. Um, the second slide here is, is, is of uh, a vignette created by Carrie Wong, an attempt to kind of evoke the feeling of these merchant families who lived on the second stories of these three-story buildings. The first floor were the stores, second floor the apartments of wealthy merchants with their women and children, and the third floor were uh, 
ceremonial rooms, rooms for visitors, and the back half of all of these buildings were warehouses or dormitories rather for, for Chinese uh, workers and laborers. Uh, this slide um, shows both a merchant home on the left with this is a garment actually that was worn by uh, Moi Bak Hin, the first um, uh, uh, consul general uh, from China uh, and, and a merchant from the Chinatown. Uh, but also on the right, a restaurant, which would have been at the right end on the second floor and balcony, uh, inside and outside for people who lived in that building and for others who came by for tea or other, uh, other, uh, other snacks. By the late 19th century, this became um, something that both Chinese women and white women were able to begin to fraternize. These were, we are arguing, the first really high-class restaurants, the first haute cuisine in Portland. Um, some of these early Chinese merchants like Sid Back would be, invite his Caucasian friends along with his Chinese relatives for New Year's dinners at, at one or two of these very famous restaurants. And it's interesting to note that one of his closest Caucasian friends, who was an official of the customs, was the father of James Beard. Uh, so there is a kind of legacy here of, of a unique uh, fresh food uh, blend of Asian and, and French even uh, kinds of cuisine styles that became Northwest cuisine beginning as early as 1900. And in old Chinatown, there were many children. The sex ratio, surprisingly, of male to female in Chinatown was closer to equality or parity, but in most rural parts of America in 1880, but that would change dramatically after the exclusion laws were passed, which left large numbers of single Chinese workers to find their way home if they could, mostly couldn't, uh, and for their merchant contractors at, to impoverish themselves by caring uh, for these aged, aging workers for many decades thereafter. Hiding in plain view at the same time was the growth of a visible anti-Chinese movement, starting in California in the 1860s and spreading through the Northwest by the 1880s as white labor and their own uh, elected officials, as this is the mayor uh, of Tacoma, Washington, stated, the Chinese must go fueled by a stunning array of inflammatory, derogatory, and insulting images published in magazines, newspapers, and broadsides aimed at convincing whites that the Chinese were as inhuman, inferior, and more lascivious than African Americans. All of the tropes created to frighten and to discuss women and men about Africans and African Americans were used against the Chinese, and the hatred had reached such a fever pitch by the early 1880s that state politicians were persuaded to support not only a federal exclusion policy, but in Seattle, Tacoma, and in other Western towns, the Chinese were physically run out of town in Los Angeles, including massacres at all of these places, Seattle, Tacoma, uh, Eastern Oregon, Western Montana, Portland, and Oregon City's Chinatowns. Some were set afire and workers were massacred by white mobs. It's no wonder that in this particular uh, cartoon, which says Oregon on his hat, that Oregon had gained the reputation of a China, Chinaman killer. The end would come quickly for old Chinatown. By 1910, as the result of a perfect storm caused by the permanent ban of immigration from China in 1904 to all Chinese. Prior to that time, merchants were allowed in uh, to establish their businesses and they were allowed to bring their families. But in 1904, it was everyone. This combined with the uh, phenomenal success of the Lewis and Clark Centennial Fair of 1905-06 created an incredible population boom and, and construction boom in downtown Portland and on the east side. This occasion, of course, very rapidly rising real estate prices and old Chinatown merchants, mostly renters, were swept away as by a tsunami. As the Chinese population plummeted, some moved to other cities and small towns seeking other economic opportunities like the grandparents 
here of Gloria Wong, who started a hog farm in St. Helens. This couple would raise 10 children, plus housing a paper son, which, guess which one, and eventually moved back to Southeast Portland after their children were grown. Uh, this woman sitting with a child on her lap, um, Gloria Wong's grandmother, is the first so far uh, identified woman to have been born in old Chinatown. We know exactly what building it is. We know who her father as a merchant was, uh, and we have verification that that is where she was born. Uh, this was in 1864. Despite legal entry until illegal entry uh, until the 1950s, many Chinese without names brought papers, uh, bought papers, giving them a false identity, proving they were related to a Chinatown resident merchant. Many of these so-called paper sons and paper daughters, we have here uh, Bertha Saigat's parents who came in 1923, and she will have a chance to tell you that story a little bit later. Uh, may, many of these people and their children would live in fear of discovery and deportation for many decades after. But at the same time, many thrived. Uh, what we're learning here, too, is that the people who came as paper sons and daughters were, were really not the, the stereotypical illiterate workers, but rather people who had connections, who had some education. And so it was doubly... Um, I would say a, an insult to be forced to the very bottom of the economic structure, but they were willing to do that in an effort to make a new life for themselves. If caught for any of these people, penalties would have been harsh and swift. There was a considerable number of deportations as a result of this law in 1904 through the 1920s and 30s. But after 1907, uh, which was the year, by the way, that the most housing starts in Portland uh, were registered as the largest number of new houses in the entire country. This is how, how significant the boom was after the World's Fair. A group of new arrivals from China and a few with means who had had businesses in Old Child combined to start a new Chinatown north of Burnside along Northwest 4th. There, they invested in new businesses and buildings, which provided first floor storefronts, see this pattern again, second story housing for both families, and in the back half, dormitories for single male workers, now called aging bachelor uncles, uh, with family only in China and no way to get home. Uh, you should, it's going to, it's sort of hard to see, but back a minute. Um, go back a minute, yeah. That, that this, uh, that the storefront on the far left, says uh, the Bo Yuan. So you can see that this was an example of one of the businesses that moved from old and new Chinatown. And it was here after the market crash of 1929 that the store closed and the inventory was put into very long-term storage. Over time, uh, the family associations and Tong's mission churches, restaurants, and laundries from old Chinatown would follow uh, along with a large number of lotteries, a family economy for many Depression era Chinese Chinatown families living in near poverty conditions. The CCBA, built by a far seeing group of local businessmen, was the anchor uh, established and erected in 1911. But make no mistake, if old Chinatown had been a prosperous and up and coming merchant community, new Chinatown was a de facto ghetto shaped by permanent exclusion laws and the racism inherent in Oregon's own laws, which apply to the Chinese as well as to other peoples of color. For the Chinese, there was literally no housing and no jobs outside of Chinatown, despite the very high level of, of education, in some cases, postgraduate education uh, by people from Chinatown. Here finally is, is, is a kind of proof. This is a typical Chinese certificate of registration, which was required after 1904. This young man, George Leong, later would become a prominent businessman, but he had to carry this paper on his person by law at all times on threat of deportation. Yet he was a natural born native of the US who lived in Portland, Chinatown, and he should have been treated as a citizen. This certificate is dated 1942. 
For a fuller and much more personal view of the new Chinatown portion of this story, I am now going to turn the program over to two of the Portland Chinatown Museum's most distinguished elders, who were also active in the oral history project started back in 2000 as part of the Old Town History Project. Bertha Lee Saiget and Norman Locke, both in their 90s now, have a rare and commanding perspective on the last decades of Chinese exclusion growing up in Chinatown, and on the period dating from the 1960s as opportunities for Chinese American citizens finally began to increase. Thank you for listening. With that, I think we will uh, turn the program over to Bertha. Thank you, Jackie. And that was a very interesting presentation and the, uh, uh, beyond the gate in the history of Portland's Chinatown. Well, bridging two distinct and diverse cultures for a daughter of Chinese immigrants from China was a challenging journey for my parents as well as for me. The President Jefferson ship brought my parents, Li Yok and Hamshi, to America in July 1923. My father's family were landowners and they farmed the land, but with political unrest, civil wars, and poor economic conditions were the compelling reasons for them to cross the Pacific to come to America. My maternal Grandfather was a very successful lawyer in Southern China. My mother led a very affluent life with amas and that are in America that would be maids. A rare for girls of her time, my mother was educated by tutors. She was, she excelled in Chinese classics and Chinese calligraphy. My Parents were sojourners. They had always planned to return to China when they made their fortune, but that never happened. With the Japanese and Chinese war in China, World War II and the communist takeover in 1949, their dreams of returning to the homeland were shattered. My dad entered the United States as a paper son and Congress had passed the Exclusion Act of 1882, which called for limiting the Im immigration of Chinese. And with this new law, the Chinese had methods of bypassing that law. And that is paper sun, which is involves in buying a certificate, which establishes the legal right to come to return to go and return to China as well. This act of, by Congress, by the way, huge numbers of Chinese subsequently became illegal aliens, including my parents. My parents faced formidable, formidable obstacles in coming to America. They did not speak or understand the English language, little economic resources, and no marketable skills. Thus, coupled with facing vast cultural differences and racial prejudice made their assimilation to this culture difficult. After my dad's arrival, he went to a church school to learn basic English. He learned some reading and writing and he spoke with an accent. My mother just had survival English and that's from her children. We did not live in Chinatown. We grew up, we lived 12 blocks west from Chinatown and Chinese school. My dad rented this old house on 15th and 16th and Flanders with need of pay, repair and paint. But we lived there until he, the building of the 405 extension. And employment opportunities was very limited for Chinese men. A relative helped my dad get a job in the laundry at the Benson Hotel. He worked there, in the, there until he was promoted to a kitchen helper. 
and later to a pastry assistant. And, and at the very end of his career, he was the head pastry chef of the, at the Benson Hotel. At that time, he felt like he had reached the American dream. He used to talk about that he was supervising, quote, Caucasians. But his $60 a month salary was not enough to sustain a large family of eight children. So my mother and tried to try to have lottery at our uh, Flanders home, but that was not successful. Later, my dad and another gentleman had a lottery placed in Northwest Second and Burnside. And then the mayor, the new mayor, Dorothy McCullough Lee, closed all the lottery in Portland, Oregon. Lottery was a big economic income for most Chinese families. And some were, that was their only source of income. And ironically, the Oregon State Kino adapted Kino from the Chinese lottery and it is now legal and very popular. And growing up in Portland as a daughter, immigrants was not easy. We not only had to live in a shroud of secrecy, but we had to take a subservient life. My parents always reminded us and emphasized that we have to be subservient, obey, don't get in trouble, don't question authority. We always had to be hard where we working, be quiet, non-confrontational. And these were the characters that was ingrained in our DNA. <clears throat> English was my second language. When I started school at, in 1931, it was Cooch School in Northwest 20th and Gleason. I didn't know a word of English and I felt awkward, timid, shy, and bewildered. During recess, I remember standing, observing, and not participating in any activities. There was no English as a second language or social services at that time. And I just felt like I was just deaf and dumb. And if it happened today, I would have been red flag evaluated for psychological evaluation. And during my time at elementary school, I wish I was American as apple pie. My mother never came to school to participate in the school functions. And I remember doing Christmas, my dad would go to Chinatown and buy a box of tea or a box of lychee nuts so we could give to our parents. And this Chinese stores invariably wrapped the tea or the lychee nuts in white paper and tied with a narrow red string and it was never ever pretty Christmas wrapping and at times we were ashamed to give we were ashamed of our ethnicity we were ashamed to give Chinese gifts to the parents and a couple of times my brother and I we would toss our pre presents in the shrubs of Temple Breath Israel Northwest 19th and Gleason but high on my parents' priorities was going to Chinese school. We attended Chinese school six days a week. And on Sundays, we went to the Chinese Baptist church. I enjoyed going to Chinese school. I look forward to it. That was my social life. And I had my friends there. And, and I had wished that I lived in Chinatown because I would have gone to Atkinson High School where they're mostly Asian students, but that never happened. My passage to Amer mainstream American life happened when I was going to high school. Up to then, I really socialized with my Chinese friends. Lincoln High School was a diverse high school represented by many ethnic groups the Chinese, the Italians, the Greeks, 
and Japanese, Japanese and Jewish. I made many friends with different ethnic groups. And one particular Italian girl, Elisa Corrado, she invited me and two other classmates to freshman weekend at Oregon State College. And that, that was the first time that I ever been to a college out of town. I have gone through B College, just walked through the college, but I spent a weekend at the Delta Zeta sorority where her sister lived, and I was just enthralled with college life. At the sorority house, they served lunch with China and linens and sterling silver, and we went to the dance, and we went to visit all the classes at Oregon State. And that weekend, I was determined that I was going to Oregon State for college. My parents always thought that my brothers would always go to college, but the women, because of the lack of jobs for women, it was not considered for women to go to college. But after World War brought the reversal of anti-Chinese racism to during that time, we had to wear identification with pictures of us state that we were Chinese. And then when we were at, with, when we met strangers at the department or at department clerks, they would give us a nice smile. As most of you know, that the Japanese Americans were interred to internment camp without trial. And that was another sad history about American culture racism. And prior to World War II, many Chinese men and women jobs were limited. Men with college degrees in science, engineering, and pharmacy had a hard time finding jobs in the respective field because of racial discrimination. And many resorted to restaurant or menial jobs. Chinese women were at the low profile jobs. They were in stock rooms and elevators or cashiers in Chinese restaurants. A couple of my girlfriends got jobs selling popcorn at the Oriental Theater on Southwest Grand Avenue. And that job, they had to wear a two piece Chinese outfit to sell popcorn. That was in the 1940s. And during wartime, there were more opportunities because the many men were in, in the service and the, and the Chinese women were able to get clerk office jobs or departments, department store jobs. And after I graduated from Lincoln High School in January 1944, I got a job at the, with the US government at the port of embarkation. I was in the mail room. I wanted the job being a clerk or typist, but I was in the mail room sorting out all the mail. I was pleased to get a job and I was very, I stayed there for seven months and saved my money for college. But, uh, and I also uh, got a job at the grocery store, it was a JK Kita grocery store. The Japanese had to sell the grocery store right away and my friend's parents bought the grocery store and that job paid 25 cents an hour. And another friend of mine, Cecilia, her dad had a restaurant and I worked there on Sundays and at some good days, my tip was more than my actual pay. So I, then 1948, I graduated from Oregon State as it was mentioned that I had a difficult time getting a job because, quote, I was Chinese. Many of the superintendents would say, well, we don't have any Chinese in our community or the school board did not approve. And at that time, I don't think there were any, there might have been one or two elementary school teachers, but no secondary teacher. In August of that year, that year, 1948, I got a call from 
the superintendent of school from Kathleen in Washington. I was offered a job at three thousand dollars a year. I teaching high school in Washington history at the Kath Lamont High School. I stayed there four years and for, and left for matrimony. In, in 1950, I did, I was offered a job at Jefferson High School, but I felt like Kath Lamont had offered me a chance to teach. I, because of loyalty, I stayed there for extra two years. And then history repeats itself again when my, when I, my husband and I were looking for a house, the realty agent took the house off the market and we got a, a better deal. We got the house for a little bit cheaper. And after, when we needed to move to a second house, the, the uh, builder had it, it asked all the neighbors if they would approve of a Chinese moving into the neighborhood and, and, and they did. So uh, the anti-racism was getting a little bit better, but th there was still underlying, I think, anti-Asian racism. But, uh, and with this COVID-19 epidemic, I think the hatred for anti-racism came back again with attacks and so, and, I think in light of all this, I think the Chinese, we have to stand up and shout out and give a voice and educate people on our history. That we must seek out to help other oppressed people of different color to make America that make an America that offers freedom, justice, and equality for our kids. Thank you. Thank you very Norman, much. this quarter tells your turn. <laughs> Are you gonna save the question and answer for after mine or do you want a question and answer for Bertha now? No, after you. No, after, after. Okay. Okay. Well, Oregon history back in the 1800s stated that no Chinese could own land and no Chinese could vote. But to my knowledge, it doesn't say immigrant Chinese or Chinese American citizens. So citizens were corralled into this trap where they could not buy or sell real estate and could not vote even though they were citizens. So after they built the railroads, in the 1860s, the culture said that uh, we didn't need them anymore. So the countries instituted the 1882 Exclusion Act, which said that Chinese could not come to America unless they were students or business people. And uh, they allowed like 50 Chinese a year to come in to America. In the meantime, other countries in Europe had unlimited access to be citizens. China had a limit of 50 people a year, can you imagine? But uh, the Chinese were moved from place to place at the convenience of the white citizens that controlled the system. So they really had no choice, they had to live and work wherever they were told to work. And my, my, my mother, my grandmother's father came here from San Francisco in the late 1880s. And uh, my mother's father was from Spokane and he owned a millinery store and he owned a supper part owner in a supper club that Bing Crosby used to sing in before he became famous. So <clears throat> my, my great aunt Helen and my grandmother was born 
in Oregon in the late 1800s. And my Aunt Helen lived here in three centuries. She lived here in the 1800s, 1900s, and 2000 when she died. In the early 1900s, time of the Lewis and Clark World's Fair, 1904, 05, my grandmother's family lived in downtown Portland. In, for those that know Portland, it was between 6th and 9th and Morrison, right in the heart of downtown. But uh, later in the 20s and 30s, they moved to the new Chinatown, which is in the northwest section of Portland. The old Chinatown in southwest 2nd and Oak area was demolished by the flood in 1894. That area of Portland was flooded and people were moving around in small boats. So that ended the old Chinatown and that's how the new Chinatown in Northwest Portland came to existence. In the 1920s to 60s, the Chinese were not hired for normal jobs this, I'm talking about Portland, Oregon, especially. So they had to create their own existence, mainly three areas, a restaurant, a laundry, or a lottery. What is a lottery? It's, it's known as Kino. You mark 80 numbers on tickets and they pay off twice a day, four o'clock and 10 o'clock. So it was a very, minimal existence. If you own a lottery, these are storefronts that Chinese lived inside and then on the front side they had the, the lottery where people came in to place their bets. For example, you could buy a 10 cents lottery ticket and you, the lottery store owner would get one cent so that was a hard way to make a living. So they adjusted for that by having pinball machines and slot machines. And that paid a lot more than the lotteries. How did they exist? It was illegal. They existed because city hall and the county officials sanctioned it because they were paid every month by the lottery companies that ran the system. So everybody got paid from city officials, county officials, the police department. And I was devastated to find this out when I was a little kid. My uncle Chester was a graduate in political science and he explained to me, this is the way cities are ran nationwide. And he quoted Chicago, New York, and different cities, how it was run by the officials and they were all taking money to allow things to happen. And I was completely devastated because I was a very idealistic and I, it was tough for me to swallow. I have in my collection, a Portland business restaurant business card and they I think it was 1920s it doesn't have the date but it says it didn't brag about their food it bragged that no Chinese are employed here that means it must be a high class restaurant this I think it was the 1920s probably carried through to the 30s Chinese were discriminated not only in employment, but they could not join clubs like the Eagles or the Elks or the Multnomah Athletic Club. And I'll give you a story of an example of discrimination. Uh, a Chinese American named Phil Wing worked at the Multnomah Club downtown for 29 years and he never got promoted to manager. And White members told me 
it was because of discrimination. So uh, my attorney was president of a country club, the Twelfth Country Club, and there was an opening, and he said, "Do you think that uh, Phil would like to apply to be a general manager of this country club?" So certainly, and so when he mentioned his name at the board meeting, the general tenor was a Chinese. And my attorney said, yes. So he managed to convince the board to hire Phil Wing. So my attorney says, uh, what, do you what do you think we should do? I said, uh, give him a good contract, a three year no cut. And if you fire him in one day, you have to pay him for three years. My attorney says, it's done. So they hired him in November. And one month later, it was December, and he got a bigger Christmas bonus in one month than he got in 29 years at the Monoma Club. This is an example of discrimination. So an example of hypocrisy in 1935, my grandmother, before 35, 1933, 32, she had a lottery downtown, but she also rented a home in Southeast Portland, approximately 13th, a block off 13th and Hawthorne. This was in the early 30s. By 1935, she decided to buy a home and uh, in those days, many Chinese had straw men, which is a front person by the home, which were white people, then secretly, secretly transferred to the Chinese that legally paid for it. My grandmother did not go through these rigmaroles. She just went out and said, I wanna buy this house. Well, she didn't have any problems because in 1935, you were lucky to make $30 a month. And this house was about $4,000 and she had the money. So the, the builder needed money. So he sold the house to my grandmother, just like that. So when she moved in, it was a nice neighborhood. It was five bedrooms, full basement, fireplace, and the, Neighbor next door was a doctor, so you know it was a nice neighborhood. And he complained to my grandmother that your sons will corrupt my daughters. And my, my grandmother says, on the contrary, your daughters would corrupt my sons. And that stopped in cold. Anyways, that's how she bought the house and the family still owns the house. It's uh, Southeast uh, 30, as the market went block off Hawthorne. It's a nice corner home, well kept. After World War II, many of the veterans were Chinese American veterans that fought for, in this country, went, came back to America and they started looking for homes outside of the, the ghetto Chinatown. And they were successful in moving here and there and Chinatown gradually compressed because they didn't have the economic support of the people that were moving out. However, on weekends, about 90% or more of the Chinese that moved out of Chinatown came to shop for groceries because they couldn't buy Chinese groceries in other sections of Portland. And they also took great pleasure in eating Chinese food in the restaurants because there were no Chinese restaurants where they were moved to. However, today there are subdivisions of Chinese in various parts of Portland to su supply all these people that have moved. Then they're very successful, they're very economically viable. So One thing that uh, when I was growing up in Chinatown, uh, we were running into different people's storefronts, just like they were our home. And uh, on holidays, 
we rejoiced in the, the lion dance ceremonies. The lion dance went to different stores, different restaurants and danced because they, they were given money for showing up to be, bring good luck to the location. So as kids, we always thought that was a great show. And we went to, we meaning my brother and I, went to a Presbyterian and Baptist church in the Chinatown community. community. And uh, many people that grew, grew up with became very successful and famous. One thing that was shocking to me always was there was nothing in our school books about Chinese doing anything. They didn't exist because it was mostly white people, Native Americans, or about black people that were slaves. So you might want to get a pencil and make a few notes, uh, but a, a Chinese is responsible for the first commercial airplane that made money. So a Chinese is a grandfather of commercial airplane industry. How do I explain that? Well, he's an MIT graduate that designed the first airplane that Boeing aircraft ever made money on. Boeing never made money on airplanes until this Chinese guy designed the plane. Bill Boeing was so impressed, he bought the first plane for himself and the next 50 planes were purchased by the US Navy. And you can Google this engineer that was the grandfather of our airplane industry. You can Google that. And another Chinese that uh, these are, there are many people like this. The Jet Propulsion Lab, you can write that down, JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, is the grandfather of our air jet industry and our space industry. And a co-founder of that is a Chinese guy. You can Google Jet Propulsion Lab co-founders and you'll get his Chinese name. He was one of the most brilliant jet propulsion engineers in the world. Somehow he displeased somebody in government and they claimed he was a spy for a foreign government, which was the most ridiculous thing that you could ever think of. So they confined him to five years of house arrest. They couldn't prove he was guilty of anything, but somehow they managed to get him under house arrest. Why five years house arrest? Well, the authorities figured that after five years, his knowledge will be obsolete. So after five years, he came out, he couldn't get a job, so he had to go to China. So now, now you know why China's jet interspace propulsion is second only to the US because this guy had nothing, to, nowhere to go. So he became the grandfather of the jet industry in China. We have race prejudice to thank for China's superior space industry. Okay, you can Google Jet Propulsion Lab and you forget his name. Here's another name that you might write, to down, write down. Beth, B-E-T-H, last name, L-E-W dash Williams. Beth Lou Williams. Google that and you'll, she's a Princeton professor of Chinese American history, which is rather unusual. She said that 95% of her students were Asians and they knew nothing about Asian American history because there's nothing in school books. She says 95% of the Asian students, which is the total class, only knew two things about Asians. The, the Japanese were interned. The Chinese built the railroad. That's all they knew about Asia, Asian Americans. And just Bertha and my talk gave you a million times more information. So, 
since nothing is in our school books, this is a big problem. How do we remedy this situation? I just dropped that in your lap. The immigration and nationality law that we signed in 1965 allows for immigration, more immigration from Asia, Africa, and Southern Europe instead of Northern Europe and the UK. So things are changing rapidly. That's my message for today. Oh, it, I have one more thing. I was an administ administrative law judge when I was young and I held a hearing in a small town, let's say Roseburg, Roseburg, Oregon. It was Roseburg and Grants Pass were the seat of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Oregon was a major center for the Ku Klux Klan. So after I conducted my legal hearings, I went to lunch with the city officials. This was in Roseburg. By the time I got back to Salem, the phone was jumping off the hook. Guess what? These city officials in Roseburg were calling, telling me they got phone call after phone call when they says, who was that Chinese guy you were having lunch with? They had not seen Asians there. It was, it was just amazing. This was 1960, 61. It's just astounded me. That's it. Thank you so much, Norm, for your very interesting uh, presentation. We do want to share some questions for the group. And Jackie, if you can unmute yourself. Uh, Jackie, Bertha, and Norman, there are some questions for you on the q and I'll uh, read them out to you. Okay. The first is for Jackie. You talked about how rest, railroad operators liked Chinese labor because they did not drink alcohol. And Tanya March is curious if alcohol was served at Chinese restaurants in the early era, particularly when Sid Buck was taking clients to these establishments. I'm not sure I can answer that, but I, I suspect because there were Caucasians present uh, that that just as many of the Chinese restaurants more recently in, in Chinatown created bars to serve non-Chinese. Uh, I, I think that probably there were there probably were alcoholic beverages. This is also, of course, a period that's that's leading up to or during prohibition. So, um, uh, so um, I, that's not a question that I've never really thought about. But but uh, tell her I'll try to get back to her about that. Sure, that was from Tanya March. Thank you, Tanya. And this is a question. I have something to say about that. Norm? What? Do you have anything to say about this, about whether or not early re Chinese restaurants served alcohol? Yes, they did. Uh, the Chinese in China had very sophisticated alcoholic beverages, but, yeah. but uh, ethnically, the DNA in Chinese are different. They do not have the They do not have the DA, DNA to stand a lot of alcohol. So right, that's, right. That, that's it. Oh, another thing, prior to the Chinese working in the railway, one of the reasons that Chinese worked in the railway was because of Mr. Crocker. Crocker is one of the most famous people in California. And the, he had Chinese working for him for 10 years before the railroad were even th thought of. And Crocker was the main man that introduced Chinese laborers to build the railroad. Because of their skills, because of their skills and their sobriety. Bertha. Well, uh, I don't know. 
I know in Chinese it, and banquets, they drink ngape, a powerful drink, but I don't think they would serve it in, in the restaurants and in American bars, but the Chinese, uh, for special cases, they drink. It's a powerful whiskey, it comes in a little brown jug, ngape. That's all I know about it, liquor. Okay. One more question regarding railroad workers, and this is from Joanne Lee. Uh, she's curious about how many Chinese workers were part of the Chinese railroad worker system uh, in total. Well, I, I would recommend that, that, that anyone who is interested, and I think we hope that, that we will have an opportunity to get more information about this in, in, in this series. We're making connections with the Stanford uh, Railroad Chinese Workers Pro Project, which has gone on for about 10 years and has produced several books. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, one of the people who, who's worked on uh, several films for the Railroad Workers Project will be part of next month's uh, series. I'm sure that there are estimations, but I don't know whether whether there are numbers that are that are reliable. I think this has been a very, very important project just because the profile of Chinese railroad workers has not been has not been clear. But I think that one thing that is clear when you think about it, I mean, this is something that 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 the interpretation of Beyond the Gate has thought is really, really significant, that we need to think about the kinds of skills, the kinds of trades, you know, that had been prominent in China for centuries. You know, this is this is really the birthplace of munitions. <laughs> you know, th these are the people who really know how to deal with mountain passes and set the and set the the, the dynamite. These are the people who come from a civilization where, where where stone cities have been created, you know, for centuries, where where building trades, you know, are 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 widespread and and highly skilled. And so, it's I think it's an error to think about railroad workers as somehow the least sophisticated, the least educated. You know, when you use the word worker, as opposed to tradesman. You know, it tends to minimize or it tends to, you know, somehow diminish um, the, 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 the skills, you know, that people did had that brought to this occupation. Um, and there's no question that building railroads was a very complicated, sophisticated and dangerous business. You know, and, and it required great organization to take huge numbers of people into the field, you know, to provide provisions for them, to provide the, 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 the technology, the housing, all of those things. And that was one of the things that, that, that Chinese Americans did very, very well. So I think what we're learning from the Stanford project and other, other sources is that while this is something that has been sort of glossed as the story, the only story, it may open the door to a more sophisticated understanding of what it was exactly that people were bringing from China that so set off their British Isles competitors. I mean, I think the truth is that they're bringing sophisticated, you know, they're bringing greater skills. It's not just their sobriety and their and their willingness, you know, to sort of take orders, but but that they really were hard workers and they knew what they were doing. Thank you, Jackie. Any other comments from Norm or Bertha? Okay. So folks, um, if you're reading the chat, there are quite a few links that you can check on to refer to uh, some of the, the interesting people and places mentioned by Norm. There are some other questions, one particular for Norm and Bertha. And this is a question from Sue and Ho. Both Saiget and Locke are not your original family last names. Would you share the reason for the name change, please? I'll start. My, my father's father, Chinese name was Ngan, Locke, something. And so they transferred his name Locke to Locke, L-O-C-K-E. So on his gravestone in Lincoln Memorial, it's, his name is Charles Locke, L-O-C-K-E. That's how it's, that's how it started. Bertha? Yes, uh, 
well, my, my dad's name was my Lee, and fortunately, when he bought the certificate, it was Lee also. And uh, my late husband's grandfather, his name was, when he came over in the 1860s to work on the western end of the Canadian Railroad, his name was Kong, K-O-N-G, Kong Sai Git. And somehow when he arrived in the country, they got Sai and Git together. This is how I got Sai Git. We're not French, it's Chinese, it's from Sai Git. So, and it was really confusing for the immigration people because, you know, in, in America, our surname is always last, you know, Jones or Smith and even Chinese, your surname is Chin and the given name, the generation name and the given names. And so it's just reversed. This mm -hmm. is how we got side gift. It should be called, really. Oh, so yeah. hope that answers your question. Huen has a follow up here. Why not correct it back to your original family name? Well, Saigit si was my late husband's grandfather's name. And so, um, my kids will have to do that, so uh, I'm going to go do that. Another question for you, Bertha. This is from Jim Mockford, who thanks you for sharing your story. He's interested in learning the name of the church school where your your father went to school. I don't know. They they just had church classes. It wasn't a school. It was just night classes to to help immigrants get basic English. Right. Yeah, oh, another... I'm sure it was a Protestant, it was a Protestant church. I went to the Chinese Baptist mission. It was not a church. It was upstairs next to an auto shop between uh, 6th and 7th and Cooch. Right. Um, I have another story about discrimination in my family. My father was educated to be a CPA and uh, in order to enter the profession, you needed two years as an apprentice in a CPA firm. And no CPA firm would allow him to be an apprentice because he was Chinese. So he offered to work two years for no salary as an apprentice, but still they kept him. They said, no, we, we don't even want you when you're working for free. So that's part of family discrimination stories. So um, another couple of questions from the audience. Uh, this one is for Jackie specifically, I believe. Uh, in the 1910s, you mentioned the second Chinatown located in Portland. Can you let Debbie Jang know where this was physically? Yes, it's north of Burnside. Uh, north of Burnside is actually the dividing place between Burn. I don't know if she's familiar with Portland. But Burnside is now sort of considered to be the division between Northwest and Southwest. Originally, it was a block south, Ankeny. Uh, and, and when where these, these, these North and South come together along second west to fourth was uh, the sort of locus of, 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 of Chinese population. There had always been uh, Chinese laundries, a few Chinese laundries, a few businesses north of Burnside, but the but the larger population had been along second from roughly Oak down to Taylor, maybe even further south than that. But after 1907, which I think I mentioned, this was partly because of, I mean, the flood had something to do with this, but it was also because there was just property values had gone out of the, up the, out of the ceiling because of the, uh, the population boom and the housing boom. And there were a lot of buildings that were being raised in old Chinatown that were not owned by Chinese and they were being created. This is the first high rises that were like at that time, 10, 10 stories, seven to 10 stories high. So um, they moved north of Burnside, which is along Northwest Fourth primarily. Uh, but the first building, uh, the first buildings that were built along Fourth were, I'm told by people who lived there that they didn't own them. And I don't know whether that's completely, whether that's absolutely true, but they were built in the style 
uh, of the old Chinatown three-story buildings. And, um, and for a while, there were a succession of buildings starting in the block between Cooch and Davis, and then Davis and Flanders, and then another building north of Flanders. So there was a, a, an amazing sort of group of, 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 of buildings that had quite beautiful buildings, actually, with stores on the first floor and apartments on the second floor and uh, uh, restaurants on the third floor and also ceremonial rooms and then housing behind. Uh, frankly, there is none of that left except for one story of one building, uh, which is uh, on, on the northwest corner of, of uh, Everett and and Forth, where there is a tong, uh, where it used to be the uh, 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 a wonderful restaurant and grocery store. Um, so uh, the CCBA was was built in 1911. It really was kind of the linchpin, and that was built on Northwest Davis Street between Third and Fourth. And in its height, uh, after World War II, Chinese were able to start to buy property for the first time. And so there were Chinese, not only Tongs, but family associations or, or, or kind of the combinations of free families bought the building that is now the Society Hotel. And on the second floor, that was the headquarters of the Chinese American Citizens Alliance for a long time. Uh, and then next door to it, the Hip Sing Tong bought that building. And so uh, this sort of started World War II. A lot of this, these properties that had been occupied by Chinese that they had rented, they did acquire property. And so there are still, there are still a number, maybe as many as eight to 10 buildings in, 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 in historic Chinatown that are owned by Chinese individuals, families, or, or, or associations. Brie? Yeah, I need to uh, go backwards again. Uh, one of the questions was asked why I did change the name back to call and I saw on the chat that my daughter-in-law remind me that, that our, my sons have the middle name is Kong. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and, Kong and Kong, I saw that it, it is means the river is the Kong. It has the three little dots and the word is so. A correction. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, that's great. A couple of questions for Bertha and Norm. Uh, as we wrap up, we have just a few minutes left, but there, there are some questions that are very poignant, I think, given the, the state of America today. Uh, so one question, particularly from Carolyn Lee, uh, for Bertha, you mentioned that your parents told you to be obedient, to work hard, and don't make trouble. And you ended your talk with the opposite advice for Asians now, given the Asian American hate out there today. How do you think your parents would react to what you said? Well, I think uh, they might come around after generations of being subservient. You know, I think it's just like, you know, the wheel that squeak gets the oil and if we don't say anything, no one's going to know about it. They think we're, we're happy with the situation. But I think we, we need our voices heard. We need to stand up for justice because uh, we are American citizens. Does Thank that you, answer your question? Norman, do you have a thoughts on that? Uh, I was never that quiet or subservient, so <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing's changed. I always, I always spoke up uh, and I always advocate, I was always on the soapbox. And my wife says, uh, people want to make up their minds. You always want people to work for themselves, to be independent. Even when I was in my 20s, we used to go to house parties. And afterwards, my wife would say, get off the soapbox. Some people like to work for somebody else. So I've always preached to work for yourself. That way, you don't have to take any guff off anybody except yourself. Thank you, Norm. You solve your own, you create your own problems and you solve your own problems. On a, a similar vein from Kristen Lum, do Bertha and Norm have advice and wisdom about the importance of building community within the Chinese and greater Asian communities as we experience this wave of discrimination because of the pandemic? I'll go first. Uh, I think 
the beginning is right now where Asian Americans from various parts of Asia are forming groups. And that's what I see is the beginning inertia of the movement to answer that caller's question. Well, I think uh, I, I think there's been a shift for people to get together and share their stories and and um, like after the pandemic, they have people, they have friends getting together and try to support each other. I think we need to do that. We need to tell our experiences and people need to know about it. And there have, there have been communities like they have with going, going down to the waterfront, just let their mess, it wasn't a protest. It was just a march. And I, I think it would be coming to that. Thank you so much. I do want to just mention in the chat and in the Q&A, there's just been a lot of uh, thanks and appreciation to Bertha, Norm, and Jackie uh, for speaking about your experiences and the history of Portland's Chinatown. So a huge amount of thanks to you three. Uh, I'd like to hand the ball back over to Kapiolani, who will close us out today. Um, thank you so much, Jackie, Bertha, and Norm today for um, your wonderful presentation. Um, we want to, if you're interested um, in learning more about our hidden history series, we have a um, presentation coming up on Saturday, June 19th at 11 a.m. It's called Picturing the Past, Using Archaeology and the Arts to Highlight Chinese Heritage in Oregon and Beyond. It will feature the archaeology and history of Jacksonville, Oregon, followed by a conversation between archaeologist Chelsea Rose, novelist Jessica Shi, and filmmaker Barry Fong. Um, if you were here for our first Hidden History series program, uh, Barry Fong was a filmmaker whose film we showed for that first one. Um, on the challenges, opportunities, and importance of researching and documenting the stories of early Chinese Americans. Um, so we'll be putting up the details for that event on our website and sending out um, an announcement very soon. We also are um, the co-sponsor of, of an event coming up um, with the Jewish Federation of Greater Portland. And they're um, hosting a Confronting Hate Summit that's coming up this Wednesday, May 26th. And I'll be putting the link to that to sign up if you're interested. It's a free event. Um, that has speakers and presentations um, from different organizations in Portland, including um, a presentation that we're hosting with the CACA on, on four avenues to stopping Asian um, hate against Asian Americans. Um, so we just wanna make sure you know about that. You can always check our website as well uh, to find out more information and to register for that. So um, again, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Thank you to our presenters today. It's been a wonderful um, learning experience. And hopefully, we'll see you all again on June 19th. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.